Why didn't I flinch? Because the laws of science differ fundamentally from those of... The very statement that talking about NASA is pandering omits, omits the fact that NASA drives our economy. The, the culture of NASA drives the culture of innovation and it's the culture of innovation that drives the economies of the 21st century. That's what it's missing. Even if there's pork spending on NASA, even if there's pork, what comes out of that spending benefits the nation in ways that a power plant or a bridge or a local road does not. I'm just, I can be honest about that. Even if some of you can't, because you're in it, you're too close, you got, I can say it and I'm saying it. You know what happens? The jobs do not go overseas. You don't have to set up tax benefits. They don't go overseas because we're innovating and they haven't figured out how to do it yet. It has to stay here in America. And you have to keep innovating. They'll eventually catch up? Fine, hand it to them. You can't simultaneously assert that we are a global economy and then cry foul if a corporation takes a plant overseas where the labor's cheaper. That's kind of part of how that works. So the solution is not trying to just prevent that with laws. You innovate so that it doesn't happen in the first place. Teacher training? We need that. It is a necessary but insufficient condition to make this happen. You can have an awesome teacher in middle school, high school. Now you want to become a scientist. You come out the other end of that educational pipeline, what do you do? We lost an entire generation of these smart people. They became like investment bankers lawyers out of the 1980s and 90s there's no place for them to take their interest in science you have big bold ambitious projects you get them all especially since the nasa science portfolio involves biologists we're looking for life it's got chemists geologists astrophysicists physicists the nasa portfolio touches all of these not only that, we need the electrical engineers, the mechanical engineers, the structural engineers. NASA is a one agency showdown. If we have an innovation culture, will resurrect some of that attitude we all had in the 1960s. So, it turns out, in science, we have dozens of senses. There's plenty of things you might want to know about, but you can't because you're limited to your five senses. If we had microwave detectors, the microwave towers would be ablaze in broad daylight and in the middle of the night. We have no such detectors. Radio waves, we can't detect radio waves. X-rays, gamma rays, this is the full sweep of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in astrophysics, we have telescopes and detectors in each one of these bands, far beyond what your naked eye can detect. Your, our senses emerge from being born an ordinary human being in this world, breathing air, walking in one G's worth of gravity. That is our life. And so in modern science, we no longer require that a successful idea make sense. And I think that's created quite a bit of confusion when a scientist says, oh, well, the whole universe was this, and a particle pops out of existence here and shows up there, and there's 11 dimensions, and this. And you hear them say, is he, is, what's he smoking? You know, you wonder what's going on with the scientists today. And the fact is, our regime is no longer grounded in the limitations of the five senses we carry with us. Half, nearly half of all scientists are religious. They pray to a god, half of all Western in America. So being a scientist does not make you not believe in God. Nearly half. Here's the difference. The scientists who are productive, who are also religious, 
do not use the Bible as their science reference. The Bible, they removed all, the, and they used the Bible as a source of their spiritual fulfillment and enlightenment. And they draw a line in the sand. And Galileo said this first. Galileo, a religious Catholic man in Italy, he said it first. He's reading the Bible, and he's got an idiot. That's a telescope. He, 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 he builds a telescope, best one ever. And he's looking at the universe and says, this doesn't match up. And so he comes up with the phrase, a brilliant phrase, in a letter to a friend of his. He said, apparently, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> so he, he drew the first line in the sand between how you might relate to your religion if you're going to live in a physical reality. Uh, que pensez-vous des plantes transgenétiques? Hmm. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm amazed how much objection genetically modified foods are receiving from the public. Uh, it smacks of the fear factor that exists at every new emergent science where people don't fully understand it or don't fully know or embrace its consequences, and so therefore reject it. What most people don't know, but they should, is that practically every food you buy in a store for consumption by humans is genetically modified food. There are no wild, seedless watermelons. There's no, there's, there's no wild cows. There's no long stem roses growing in the wild, although we don't eat roses. You list all the fruit and all the vegetables and ask yourself, is there a wild counterpart to this? If there is, it's not as large, it's not as sweet, it's not as juicy, and it has way more seeds in it. We have systematically, genetically modified all the foods, the vegetables and animals that we have eaten ever since we cultivated them. It's called artificial selection. That's how we genetically modify them. So now we can do it in a lab, and all of a sudden you're going to complain? If you're the complainer type, go back and eat the apples that grow wild. You know something? They're this big and they're tart. They're not sweet like red delicious apples. We manufactured those. That's a genetic modification. Do you realize silk cannot be produced in the wild? The silk worm, as we Cultivated has no wild counterpart because it would die in the wild. So there's not even any silk anymore. So we are creating and modifying the biology of the world to serve our needs. I don't have a problem with that because we've been doing that for tens of thousands of years. So chill out. <laughs> and so people at the time, led by people such as Voltaire, asked the question, if there is a God, and we had this tsunami that killed 80,000 people and wiped out a holy city on a holy day, collapsing churches onto people's heads, then either God is not all-powerful, or God is not all-good. If we define good by being interested in your health and longevity, that's a fair definition of being good, I would think. And so that, that created an entire philosophical rift in the theological community, and people parted ways at that time. So when I look at the universe, and I see asteroids coming down to strike and rendering species extinct, I see forces of nature that would just as soon have us dead or extinct. I don't see the goodness in the world that people speak of. And am I, am I being selective? I, I don't think so. A tsunami hit Indonesia, a quarter million people died. An earthquake hit, hit Haiti, a quarter million people died. This is nature. So when people define God in that way, I don't see the all good part. I see some good, I see a lot of bad. Nature trying to interrupt my health and my longevity. Another thing, take a walk up and down Broadway right here in Manhattan. 
in New York City and go poke your head into each elevator bank. And you will find out that 75% of them, I did this experiment, do not have a number 13. Check it, have you seen this? Look next time. And I'm thinking, this is the, not 21st century America. I'm gonna go next time, I'm gonna go on a, uh, uh, I'm gonna get a Sharpie and cross out the number 14 and put 13 next to it. I could say, who are you fooling? That's the 13th floor. So you have people afraid of the number 13. If people are afraid of numbers, what hope do we have in this world? This is scary. Just afraid of a number. I don't, I, I, I'm going to appeal to you in a way that most people don't. I'm going to tell you things other people are not telling you. You get people who are space enthusiasts, let's go into space, it's our destiny, it's our next, great nations do it, and I look at history and I say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Here's what we got to do. We've known since the Industrial Revolution and earlier that innovation in science and technology, yes, it'll help defend the nation. But when you're not at war, you know what else innovation in science and technology does? It is the engine of tomorrow's economy. The engine. When Einstein wrote down his equation for the stimulated emission of radiation, which is the foundation of the laser, was he thinking to himself, barcodes? <laughs> this is innovation in science, the applications of his ideas into machines, requires the clever engineer, creative investors and, and dynamic CEOs turn it into product. Don't ever tell me, why are you studying this? How is it helping me? You know, I don't know how it's going to help you. I have no idea. Neither did Faraday. He just knew you would tax it. Neither did Einstein. Neither did anybody who made great discoveries about our understanding and our relationship to nature. Get the chemical ingredients of life itself. Put them in order. In, in rank order, you get hydrogen, which comes from the water molecule. You get oxygen, which comes from the water molecule. You get carbon, it's the foundation of our chemistry. You get nitrogen, in order. And the next one is the most famous element of them all. It's on every single list. It's called other. Okay, so hydrogen, <laughs> oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, other. Now you go, let's, that's, in, that's in life. Now let's turn to the universe and say, hey, universe, what do you have? ranked among your elements. What's number one for you? Hydrogen. What's number two? Helium. Well, if you remember from chemistry class, helium is inert. You couldn't do anything with it chemically even if you tried. So let's skip that. Next in the universe, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, other, thank you. So, we are one for one the same ingredients in the universe, which itself is a bit humbling. If we were made of an isotope of bismuth, then you'd have an argument. You say, hey, we're, we're rare stuff. Come here, check us out. Look at where we are, all right? And but like, no, no, we're made of the most common ingredients of the universe. But those ingredients are traceable to the actions of high mass stars that forge these elements in their core, destabilized, exploded spread their enriched ingredients, their guts, across the galaxy, creating environments where the next generation of stars will have the ingredients that can then make planets and people. And so, not only are we in this universe, the universe is in us. And I know of no more enlightening, ennobling, enriching thought than that. That is the thought I'll leave you with this evening. Thank you for your attention. Wow.
and I want you to understand something and not forget. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Religions all over the world constitutes what we call belief systems. Okay? And your freedom to believe whatever you want is a right and even a privilege in a free society. That's a good thing. Consider, however, that if you believe something that's part of a religious philosophy, and someone else has a different religion that's a different religious philosophy, and you're not agreeing with one another, and there's another religion over here, and another over here, and they don't agree, you're still free to believe what you want. But what that tells you is that it is unstable to build a government on a belief system. What you want is, what you want is objectively verifiable truths around which we can all agree. That's what you build your economic system on, your governance on. Once you have that, then you go forth to your mosques and to your churches and to your Go forth and preach and believe whatever you want. But know the difference, as Galileo did, between how to go to heaven and how the heavens go. That's my answer to you. Innovations and creativity in science, engineering, technology, and math will be the drivers of tomorrow's economy. Jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs. That's the word. In four letters. Jobs. And if you are not a participant on that frontier, you will trail behind it and possibly get left behind entirely. Most American kids opt out of the harder math and science classes, as you know. So I think most people opt out of hard things. And many of those jobs that pay sixty, seventy thousand, eighty thousand dollars you need a lot of calculus. You and do. You need math. You, you do. You need science. And you need physics. Math needs better marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Hire a marketing firm or something. There are people who say, I'll never need this math, these trig identities from 10th grade or 11th grade, or maybe you never learned them. Here's, here's the catch. Whether or not you ever again use the math that you learned in school, the act of having learned the math established a wiring in your brain that didn't exist before. And it's the wiring in your brain that makes you the problem solver. Why did you become a scientist? Since age nine, the universe chose me in a first visit to the local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. Ever since then, had you asked me what I want to be when I grow up, that annoying question that adults always